Welcome to part three. So after the rebellion comes waltzing on back into town like nothing ever happened, Nathan returns to find that the band of peasants they were training are now a well-oiled militant machine, supplied with state-of-the-art weaponry and the best training Uncle Sam can provide. Now they can go kill those rebels. Who were just hanging out in town like nothing ever happened. Well, maybe they can have better luck fighting the Emperor's next enemies. Unless he invites them over for tea, too. I wonder what you get for slapping the Emperor square in the face. Is it a gift basket? Anyway, so then Katsimoto and the Emperor have a dialogue wherein the Emperor condemns him for rising up against him. Katsimoto responds that he was only rising up against his enemies who would advise him out of their own self-interest, and that if the Emperor still wishes his death, he need only ask for it. The Emperor declines, saying that he still needs his voice on the council. Yeah, because that's a guy you want on your council. I mean, it's not like he's going to do anything rash like sabotage the railroads like he already did or anything. Yeah, but what you don't seem to understand is that if the Emperor himself ordered him to stand down, then he would. And the reason the Emperor treats him this way is out of respect and love for his old teacher. Katsimoto insists that it is the Emperor's voice they need on the Council, not him or any of his advisors. The Emperor responds by saying that he needs advisors that understand the modern world. This scene is well acted and well spoken, but I have two huge problems with the context. First, it is a shameless act of hypocrisy for Katsimoto to condemn the Emperor's advisors for advising him out of their own self-interest when that's exactly what he's been doing here. No, he is advising him out of the interest of the country and the people and the Emperor himself. He knows that the Emperor is not running the country like he should, like the way he was taught to. Plus, if Kasumoto was acting out of his own interest, he wouldn't tell the Emperor to speak for himself. He would just tell him what to say and do, like the rest of his advisors are currently doing. He is trying to help the Emperor understand what an Emperor should do and be, and not to do what other people are telling him to do. Everything Katsimoto has done in the film so far is out of his own self-interest. Granted, he believes that his interests are and should be identical with the common interests of his people, but they are nonetheless a fight for what he wants over the wants of others, including the Emperor. Second, and forgive me for sounding like someone who is irritated at the structure of this film being twisted into stupid in order to make the plot move, but isn't this conversation something that should have taken place before Katsumoto amassed an army to rise up against the Emperor and his advisors? I will actually agree with Matthew because he actually makes a decent point here, and this is one of my few complaints about the movie, and it's the plot hole that he is pointing out right here. So I will concede this point to him. To the railroads. In fact, the Emperor flat out tells Katsumoto to tell him what he should do, to which Katsumoto responds, I'm not the Emperor. You are. You have to decide this on your own. Um, I'm sorry, Katsumoto, but bullshit. You've been telling the Emperor what he should do the moment you rose up against him and his wishes. Only you've done it in a stupid order. Attack first, advise later. This film is trying to have it both ways on everything here. Katsumoto is against the Emperor, but he isn't. He doesn't want to influence the Emperor, but he does. So meanwhile, Nathan sits down with Omura, who tells him that Katsumoto can't be allowed to recruit more followers to his cause, and that if he can't stop him tonight on the Council, he wants Nathan to stop him in battle with the new well-trained army. And with these new weapons, you will crush him. But they're all just hanging out in town right now. Why don't you just go arrest them? Um, because they're under the supposed protection of the Emperor during their time in Tokyo. Did you already forget that? Nathan doesn't directly refuse, but his disdain for Omura and what he wants to do is clear, and he leaves. Omura then says the following. Okay, now try saying that about everyone else in the Rebellion. I mean, if you're okay with assassination tactics and you already have the Rebellion here, what do you need the army for? Once again, the Rebels are under the supposed protection of the Emperor, but Nathan is not. 
that is why he can tell this guy to kill him if needed. So as Nathan walks down the street, Wormtail tells him that the Emperor has passed anti-samurai laws. Conveniently enough, a few military officers demonstrate this on the young man Nathan got to know up in the mountains. Now, in a non-retarded world, they all would have just likely have done their jobs, but the movie needs them to be jerks to let us know how jerky and poopy head what they're doing to the samurai is, so they all mock and ridicule him for no reason. Finally, they decide to chop off his hair, which is apparently a dishonor for a samurai. So let's see, how can they do this scene? I don't know, maybe a quiet tear running down his face as they cut off his hair, some somber music playing in the background. Of course not. This is the last samurai. We would never know this is supposed to be dramatic unless it's totally overdone. So there is no way they could have made this scene come across without him going... You really make me sick. You even realize that the top knot is a sign of honor. And yet you made this statement? Do you realize that to the samurai, honor is one of the most important things in the world, even more important than their own lives? They were taking a part of him, the part that symbolized his honor as a man and as a samurai way, and you really expect him to do nothing more than the sexy cry? So after this, Katsumoto goes to the council meeting where Omura is still promoting an alliance and integration with the West. Katsumoto enters, and already there seems to be a problem. Swords are apparently forbidden in the council chambers in front of the Emperor, but Katsumoto insists that wearing the sword is a sign of respect, and then the scene goes like this. Give up your sword. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. All right, then you're under house arrest and will be executed. You have 609,000 hours before we kill you, which gives Nathan time to go to an exciting rescue. So here's the way things work as I understand them. Creating an uprising against a living god by slaughtering his armies and ransacking his railroads is punishable by being reinstated into the Emperor's council and roaming his streets freely, but not putting your sword down is punishable by death. The Emperor was wanting to end this thing peacefully by putting Kasumoto back onto the council. He wanted to end the bloodshed. Was the Emperor's decision. Plus, as for why Kasumoto brought the swords into the chamber, you were incorrect when you stated that the Emperor passed the law. The movie states that Omura put the law into effect. And since Kasumoto does not see Omura as a person of authority, he, his honor dictates that the only man that can tell him to place his sword down is the Emperor. And by the Emperor not doing anything and just sitting there and letting Omura do as he did, he was justifying the new law, which is why he got arrested here. Does that make sense? After hearing that Katsumoto is going to be executed, Nathan then sets off to rescue him, but is ambushed by a few dudes. They outnumber him, but Nathan takes them all down because, in case you forgot, he's a badass. Wait, you guys aren't samurai? Then what the hell are you using swords for? All the other guards were using guns. The law did not include military officials and members of state, so they were able to carry swords, and this was an assassination attempt, so going on with guns blazing would have made it pointless, seeing as that would have drawn a lot of attention. As for the purpose of the scene, it was meant to show that Algren was now more samurai than he was anything else. I guess we wouldn't be as impressed with Algren's stunt work if they had just shot him. So Nathan and a lot of Katsumoto's friends break him out, but in the rescue, Katsumoto's own son is mortally wounded. Okay, well, you guys did a pretty good job with the goodbye scene between father and son, so let's just give him a quiet death and move- Ugh, <laughs> good riddance. God, you are an ass! You remember that thing called the Will of the Warrior that you mentioned, and the other thing called Honor? His Honor would not allow him to die the quiet death you are speaking of when he still had an opportunity to help and protect those he loved. So yes, keep on insulting the guy for doing what his culture and honor dictated him to do. You know, die with his honor? 
Let's see you just go off and die in a corner very quietly as you know your friends and family are in danger. So on their way home, Katsumoto tells Algren that the Emperor could not hear his words and would not listen. Well, yeah. That's because you didn't say anything to him. You were too busy trying to hold on to your sword. If you had just stuck the damn thing in the corner, then at least you might have been able to convince him with your words. So, I don't know, maybe put your sword down next time. Go watch that scene again and you will see that he actually says a lot through his actions. Once again, he was trying to show the Emperor that he should not forget the old ways. And by holding onto his swords, he thought this would help get the message across. That and him telling the Emperor that he is the only one who can order him to remove his swords. Katsumoto considers killing himself in disgrace, but surprise, surprise, Nathan convinces him to gather their forces for a final showdown. Now, I know you're probably all thinking that this is going to be your standard final showdown scene with the smaller numbers leading them into a clever trap and charging into certain death with impunity, but, well, it is. The ending battle is basically a scene we've seen a hundred times before. Captain Jerkface gets his comeuppance, Katsumoto dies in glorious battle, seeing his perfect flower before he does, and Nathan ends up being the one sole survivor. Not bad, just nothing special. Yeah, not counting that the battle stops immediately when Katsumoto dies and that all the opposing soldiers lay their arms down and bow in respect for a man that they all knew and loved to respect and honor his passing, which says... Multitudes. So much was said in that one moment of this movie, and I cannot believe that you passed it over completely. Finally, in the end, Nathan approaches the Emperor and presents him with Katsumoto's sword. After a few words with him, the Emperor decides that the Japanese must hold on to their traditions because it is a part of who they are, and he denies the United States Treaty at the last minute proving that Nathan's theatrical repetition of a point in the end is always better than Katsumoto telling him this over and over throughout the whole movie in the first place. Yes, even though Algren never mentioned any of that in this scene, it was the Emperor finally coming to the realization on his own of what Katsumoto was trying to say this whole time. Plus, don't forget that the Emperor gives Omura's fortune to the people of Japan and tells him if he doesn't like that, then he has the right to die with honor by killing himself showing that he has finally realized what he was meant to be as the Emperor, and has decided to live his role as he was meant to, once again glancing over more points the imp that the movie was trying to make. You're doing a bang-up job here, Matthew. Thus ends The Last Samurai. The movie was simply underthought and overdone. We have kernels of good ideas that are not implemented well by anyone involved. In different hands, these ideas and issues could have been pulled off relatively well. In fact, I think this was the case with regard to Avatar. But this movie simply has it all, just in the wrong places. The end. Yeah, so you're not going to get any real final... Yeah, so you're not going to get any real final thoughts from me. I think everything I had to convey was there in the commentary itself. I will see you guys next time. Adieu. Okay, class is dismissed. Ugh! <sighs>